Linear approximations are basically nothing else but the tangent line with a different name, so computationally we shouldn't have much of a problem as we are working our way through this section. However, the interpretation and the spirit is a good bit different from what we have done so far, and that'll require a little bit of a mental adjustment, also because uh, this topic of approximation has quite a few connections to the sciences as well as this topic of approximation being the start of thinking about numerical issues. So let's take a look at linear approximations and then let's make the connections as necessary. Okay, well, we know that tangent lines approximate differential functions and in fact we know that tangent lines approximate differential functions rather well, right? If we zoom in on a tangent line, then as the zoom gets tighter and tighter, the tangent line looks more and more like the function itself. If we stop this one here for a minute and scroll it all the way back at this, in this picture, the tangent line doesn't look much like the function except that it of course touches rather nicely here. And if we now zoom in, of course, our picture gets smaller, but within that smaller picture, the function more, the tangent line looks more and more like the function. And, uh, well, that is basically the idea for linear approximation. As long as we zoom in far enough, the tangent line is close to the function near the point where we computed the tangent line. And, uh, well, straight lines are the easiest functions to work with. And so as long as the error is not too large, it is fairly natural in a computation to replace functions with their tangents. Or let's just say it used to be that way until digital calculators made ugly numbers very quickly accessible. And so we will take a look at that process here and we will then also show how this idea is used to analyze error propagation and that is where computing devices or not this idea of using linear approximations will retain its place in science and in mathematics. So what's the definition? Well if you've got a function that is differential at a, then the linearization or the linear approximation of the function f near a is defined to be L sub a of x being f prime of a times x minus a plus f of a. So at a, this function has the value f of a. It is a straight line and its slope is f prime of a, which means it is the tangent line. The idea behind the approximation, however, now is that we want to use this tangent line as a replacement for the function. So it's the tangent line just viewed a little bit differently and we now think because we now think of it as a possible replacement for the function near the point a. As an example, well, find an estimate for the square root of 82 and let's just let's leave comments out. Let's just see if we can do this without a calculator. Well, one of the things we know is that 82 is really close to 81 for which we know what the square root is. So if we take the function, which is root x, and if we take the derivative, which is 1 over 2 times root x, well, then the linear approximation of the square root function near 81 is 1 over 2 times root 81 times x minus 81 plus square root 81, which is just the formula from the previous panel. And, of course, we can work out what the square root of 81 is. So we get 1 18th x minus 81 plus 9. And that would mean that f of 82, assuming that the linear approximation is still good enough is approximately the linear approximation at 81 uh, of 82. And that would be 1 18th, 82 minus 81 plus 9, so that's 9 and 1 18th, which is approximately 9.0556. And if we compare that with the value from a computer algebra system or a calculator, it's approximately 9.0554. So that's really, really close, right? This linear approximation gives us the first three digits of the actual value as we can see here. Now, uh, let me scroll here. That example is mainly of historical interest because for goodness sakes, if you need the square root of 82 by now, there are phones that give you that number and you don't have to call anybody to ask. You just type it into the calculator app, right? So they're, they're also good for practice, however. The question that you can ask at this stage is, well, what are we practicing for? Well, let me show you. Linear approximations are being used in physics when, for example, a complicated equation 
could be solvable if only a certain term was simpler. So for example, physicists very often say that the sine of x is approximately equal to x for small x. And that is correct and very reasonable because the linear approximation near zero of the sine function is the function f of x equals x. That's the linear approximation of the sine of x near zero because the first derivative of the sine is the cosine, which is 1 at 0, and it goes through 0, so this straight line is just x. So, for example, and you are in that place right now, maybe already, when an equation in a physics text does not want to make sense, or when you see approximation signs in a physics derivation, it really pays to check if somebody used a linear approximation. And, of course, that, especially if, if you are similar in your approach towards these things as I am, I always wanted to like things to be exact. That is something that feels a little bit strange. It takes some getting used to. You want things to be exact. Well, the physicists want it to be exact too, but if the computation can only be led to a good conclusion with a certain approximation, and if that approximation, in fact, is reasonable, then that approximation is just being used. Uh, models that use these linear approximations are still really surprisingly accurate because the simple pendulum as well as the equation for an oscillating string, which are both examples that you can see in my differential equations course if you take it, uh, those examples are still, uh, those differential equations are using approximations such as sine x being approximately equal to x, and they are very, very accurate. So one reason why linear approximations won't go out of style simply is that in quite a few even derivations in the theory, these linear approximations are very advantageous to get a first model or to get a computable model, a model that is solvable by hand. Let's look at another example where we look at this from a numerical point of view. I want us to find the largest interval about a equals 81 on which the square root is within three digits, I guess, 0 0.001 of its linear approximation at a equals 81. Well, one thing that we could do there is we could simply graph the square root function, graph its linear approximation, and that picture is, of course, worthless because I can't see three digits on this thing. So, what you want to do as you look at the difference between the function and its linear approximation is you want to plot the absolute value of the difference, which is what I've written down here. And when we do that, well, we get the absolute value of the difference, and we can see that certainly as we go away from 81, the approximation gets worse and worse, and the cutoff value is 0 0.001, and so then if we just zoom in on that, or uh, work it maybe out even as, a, as, a, as an equation with a computer algebra system, we end up with an interval that from about 78.6031, which is here, to about 83.4329, which is here, and I use the computer algebra system to do that, on that interval about is where the square root function is within 0 0.001 of its linear approximation at a equals 81. Now, of course, that is another toy problem because if I need a good approximation for the square root function, I'm not going to use linear approximations, but the spirit of experimental numerical analysis is in here because ultimately, you will have certain performance guarantees, you will have certain guaranteed error formulas, and you may just implement something and then use a higher order approximation and see how good a lower order approximation is. Because if you only need 15 digits, let's say, and a 20th order approximation basically gives you the same as a 15th order approximation, you'll learn what that is when we talk about Taylor polynomials. But if those give you the same thing, then you will go with a lower order approximation because it can be computed faster. And the idea is to just set it up like that. So one thing that you can see here is then that approximation really is not an exact science, unless you have specifications how close you must be. And in that case, you would use approaches as above, where you have some model that is really exact. And you would do that when you're uh, building computational tools, maybe an operating system or so that helps you to compute quantities that you actually can compute that are within your reach. Uh, or you would use error formulas like for Taylor polynomials, and that is a different presentation, as I already mentioned. And then I might also weave in right here, linear approximations are a special case of Taylor polynomials, and that means we are not going to present a 
separate error formula here really as soon as you talk about errors and linear approximations you typically want to jump into Taylor polynomials anyway. And that leads us to the subject of error propagation which is where linear approximation also will keep its place in the sciences and it all starts with the very simple realization that measurements usually aren't exact. For example, when you buy a 16 ounce box of cereal, do you really believe that you have exactly 16.0000 and you keep going with zeros? Do you really believe that that measurement is totally exact? Of course not. Uh, when an Olympic swimmer swims the 200 meter freestyle in 1 minute 43 seconds and 99 hundredths, which is, if I looked it up correctly, a, a very, very good time actually, do you really believe that that means the time was exactly 1 minute and 43.99 and a bunch of zero seconds? In fact, in Olympic swimming for a while, the records was kept down to the 1,000th one place. I think that was somewhere in the 70s or 80s. And ultimately, the governing body decided because a thousandth is just such an out-touch or so that they ultimately went back and said, we're only going to record hundreds. Of course, that means that sometimes two swimmers are tied and photographs have to be consulted as to who outtouched whom, uh, which then leads to all sorts of other controversies. But basically, for what we're looking at here for the scientific part of it, we realize that there is a limitation to the exactness of measurements. Sometimes it's by choice, but certainly also sometimes it's simply the nature of things, because no company that manufactures cereal, manufactures cereal should spend any significant amounts of money to make sure that packaging is uh, correct down to the two, four, six, eighth digit behind the decimal point. I mean, that, that's just ridiculous. Okay, yeah, so for a while thousands were reported in swimming. So independent of whether we like it and independent of controversies, as I mentioned, uh, if we measure a quantity to be x, we should actually report the error delta x2. And typically that's what you do in science labs. And the way you report the quantity then is x plus minus delta x. Okay, so it is not precisely x. And stuff you can count, of course, is the obvious exception. So if in a science lab you have to count how many specimen you have, well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you have 5 specimen. That is not something we report an error. Okay, so as an example, let's just take the formula for the period of a simple pendulum that is given by the formula 2 pi squared L over G, where G is uh, the gravitational acceleration of the Earth. And if the length of the pendulum is 0 0.200 meters plus minus 0 0.005 meters, what is the period and what is the error in the period? And well, a simple pendulum is nothing else but a cuckoo clock. So here is a picture of um, a cuckoo clock that belongs to my wife. You can see that the numbers are close to accurate, actually. Okay, not the errors and all that, but the length, yeah, that thing has about a 20 centimeter long pendulum. Okay, so what do we have? We are interested in uh, delta T over delta L. And that would be the error in the output divided by the error in the input. And if we assume g to be constant, well, then that is approximately the derivative at L. And the derivative is 2 pi times 1 over 2 times the square root of what's inside, which is L over g times 1 over g. And when you simplify that, you end up with, well, the 2s are canceling. The square root g cancels with the g to give us, give us another square root g in the denominator. And so it gives us pi over square root Lg. And that is, if you plug in all the numbers, and that's something that you, of course, do with a calculator, that is 2.2429 seconds per meter. And so if you, that's a weird unit, right? But that is basically now because when we solve for delta L, our delta T, our error in T, is approximately 2.2429 seconds per meter times delta L, and delta L is measured in meters. And so when we work that out, the meters cancel. So the delta T, the error in the period, which is a time, will be given in seconds. And when you multiply that out, you end up with 0 0.011 seconds. 
of course you also need to know what the period is and so t is 2 pi square root L over G uh, and if we plug that in if we plug in the 0 0.2 meters and the 9.81 meters per second squared and work out all the units we end up with a period of 0 0.897 seconds and because the error starts in the second digit it doesn't make sense to report more than two or three digits in fact there's a convention that I think we will see on the next panel and uh, well that already is it here's the period here is the error and so the idea in an error computation is that output error divided by input error is approximately equal to the derivative and uh, we however have to re realize that g can have an error also because it's a measured value it is not constant on earth I think let's see because the earth flattens out a bit because of its rotation the gravita gravitational acceleration is higher or lower on the equator than on the poles. I'm not quite sure on that right now because of course the rotation already uh, exerts a force on you there but I think the gravitational acceleration is higher at the poles, at uh, higher at the equator than it is at the poles but I could be wrong on that right now. Okay so G could have an error too and the propagation of multiple errors is handled in very similar fashion in multivariable calculus so we will get to that when we have multivariable calculus. In terms of uh, understanding the error, basically if y is equal to f of x, then the output error delta x is delta x approximately f prime of x times delta x. And so if we want to visualize it, let's take a look at an x-axis, a y-axis, and a function. What we'd like to have is we'd like to have an exact input that turns into an exact output y. But what does happen is, of course, that our input is within a range from x minus delta x to x plus delta x. And as we want to estimate that error, we don't necessarily want to use the function itself. We want to have a quick estimate. Okay, you could rightly say that, again, with calculating devices, we could also just keep track of intervals. However, that basically doubles your computational effort. Such arithmetics are available. However, they're called interval arithmetics. They are just a good bit of work and sometimes just more work than it is worth for a situation such as this one and so then we have to think about where does x minus del delta x go and we're using the linear approximation to get a y minus lowercase delta y here and where does x plus delta x go well it goes to y plus delta y I'm trying to distinguish that here from the delta in quite a few texts people will write this as dx and dy pretending that these are differentials and I just have to beg to differ with colleagues differentials are entirely different conceptual quantities and so what we really are still talking about is an approximation for an error and if you want to record that as a delta rather than a d or a capital delta that is just fine and however what you can see here is of course because the slope of the tangent line is f prime of x this delta will just be f prime of x times delta x in either direction so that is also something that is nice here because we're doing a linear approximation we don't have a larger error in one direction than in the other direction of course you could rightly say um, what happens if the input uh, error is so big that this difference actually becomes perceptible so that this difference really matters here and when that is the case again I go back to a comment that a very nice physics professor made to me in a physics lab where I asked a similar question and he said look if that becomes an issue you need better equipment because when that becomes an issue mathematics isn't going to fix these systemic problems for you that is when you just need to find better equipment better, better ways to measure things so you want to focus your effort on shrinking the delta x not on estimating what its, F, um, what, its, uh, what its effect is. Okay, so basically the convention that goes with that is when you measure and when you report final results, you report those things as x plus minus delta x, where x denotes the best possible estimate and delta x denotes the error. If delta x starts with a 2 or higher, so if the significant digits of delta x start with a 2 or higher, then we recount x, we round x and delta x to the first non-zero digit of delta x 
and if delta x starts with a 1, so you get 0 0.011 like we had previously, then we round the x and delta x to the second non-zero digit of delta x because basically when your delta x is so close to flipping to being one place farther down the line, then it does make sense to report one more digit already. And the definition for errors then is sometimes you want to also compare errors between inputs and outputs that don't have the same units and so if x is a quantity that has a an absolute error of delta x then the relative or percentage error of x is defined to be the ratio delta x divided by x and that'll be I think our last example here if the radius of a sphere has been measured as 15 inches with an error of plus minus 3 percent we want the percentage error of the volume of the sphere well the volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed and that'll be approximately, and that's just something that you stick into a calculator, of course, it's approximately 14,137 cubic inches. The derivative of the volume to compute the error propagation is 4 pi r squared. And so delta v is 4 pi r squared delta r. Well, delta r over r is 0 0.03, that's the 3%. That means delta r is 0 0.03 times r and that means that it's 0 0.03 times 15 inches that's something you can work out in your head that's 0.45 inches and so delta v is 4 pi times 15 inches squared times 0.45 inches which is approximately 1272 cubic inches of course again that is something that you work out with a calculator and so that means v is 14100 cubic inches we're rounding to v a uh, hundredth digit because with the error started with the delta v starting with a one we want to round to the next digit here so we round to the hundredth digit and that's plus minus 1300 cubic inches again we're losing all these beautiful digits here that took some time to compute but realize that if your error is this big then these digits here no matter how you computed them they are meaningless because your error bounces it around too much okay so that should be the finish point here. Yeah, okay, so you can now also work out that 1300 over 14,100, that's about 10%. Actually, when you work it out, you realize it is 9%. And uh, that means we also have the percentage error of the volume and realize that in order to get the percentage error, really, we have to first take the input percentage error, compute it in, turn it into a delta R, compute the delta V, and then work out delta V divided by V. So in this computation, as far as I can see, there aren't any shortcuts, or let's just say I wouldn't recommend any shortcuts because those would probably be specific to the context of that particular problem that you're looking at uh, that you're looking at at the time. And the idea here really is to just uh, internalize two very simple things: that the tangent line can be used as a replacement, as an approximation for the function and then we're talking about linear approximation, as well as the fact that, secondly, delta output divided by delta input is approximately the derivative. Everything else, then, is really something that you will learn in practice when you work with errors and when errors compound each other. And that is where I thought I'd, I'd show you something real quick, how errors can compound in a realistic situation. Now, okay, I just lost my camera, but I think the camera will be back. Here we are. Um, because one place in which error propagation is important is uh, manufacturing. So here I have a little vise that is actually quite heavy. It's steel. Um, it's a vise that I made in, a, in an apprenticeship that I had to do for my physics undergraduate work. The purpose of that was to show us aspiring physicists, even though I turned out to be a mathematician ultimately, what can and cannot be done in a shop. And when you make something like this from multiple parts, well, every one of these parts here, whether it's 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 the kick plate here or whether it's whether it's the moving part or the the um um I don't know the English words for it <laughs> or whether it is is the, the final part on my left you're right at this stage. Basically, all these parts 
uh, are manufactured and that manufacturing has a little bit of an error. I think we had to do this to the tenth or the hundredth of a millimeter. And uh, well then as you put parts that have errors together, one of the biggest dangers is, and this was very frustrating for some of us, this slider here still has to move as you do that. And so if the bottom plate has too wide a part where the slider goes in, or if the groove in the slider is too narrow, then this thing will not move as smoothly as it is moving here. And in fact, some of my friends then had some heartbreak because they could move it forward. When it moved backward, it got stuck. And then this part ripped off, actually. And so they had to manufacture this screw over again. And um, aside from this being a war story, basically what that tells you is that as you are making these things, errors compound and ultimately an error here and an error here can turn into something that is disastrous where then the shop floor supervisor says, okay, make those parts over again. Error estimates and analysis of error propagation, of course, is exactly what safeguards against something like that. As you're working as an engineer or as a scientist, you will work with expensive equipment. You will, ha will have to give people specs for something that takes quite a bit of time and quite a bit of money to manufacture. And when you do that, you want to give specs based on error estimates in such a way that whatever people manufacture for you will work on the first try. Because now that even parts like these are completely manufactured by computer-driven machinery, I had to file these things, parts, parts of these things I had to file down by hand. Some of it was done of course, uh, with a milling machine and with a turning machine. But as there is very little hand manufacturing anymore, whatever specs you give are the specs that you will get. And so if the equipment doesn't work, will be a problem with the specs, not so much of the manufacturer. So make sure that as you're doing error analysis, make sure that you take the error propagation into account as accurately as possible so that, uh, well, so that if you're manufacturing little visors, that the screw doesn't rip off from the part that moves. All right, with that, I've probably talked a little bit too much about visors and things like that. The computations shouldn't be too bad on that homework, and I'll see you in the next presentation.